it, it says here in verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. I don't know what has caused you hurt or pain or grief, whether it's been circumstances, bad things that have happened, sickness, a lot of things that go on, but it says here that he is going to take all that away. And I want to go back into Revelation to chapter seven. And I, we talked, have talked, there are so many throne room visions in the book of Revelation. And when I say a throne room vision, it's like you see all these people around the throne and they're worshiping. There's multiple. It's, you find them on almost every chapter. But here in um, chapter 7 of Revelation, uh, verse 14, it says, well, let me go back to 13. He says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed, arrayed in white robe? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, that's verse 14, and he saith to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of Lamb. Verse 15, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sits on the throne shall be among them. They shall hunger no more, this is verse 16, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. It says for, in verse 17, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto the living fountains of water, waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Do you see that? It's to me, we're seeing a repeat of what's in Revelation 7. Yeah over here in chapter 21 that he's gonna there's no more sorrow no more crying all those things are done with and verse 5 here in revelation 21 it says and he that sat upon the throne said behold i make all things new and he said unto me right for these words are true and faithful we know that the word of God is true. And you know as well as I do, nothing is too hard for him. If, when you read in Genesis, in the very first chapter, where it talks about in the beginning, and it said, God said, let there be light, and there was light. All things, they're just, all things are created by him, just by the spoken word. Uh, John 1 and 1 through verse 3. Uh, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by Him and for Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. That's that's God. He's just... And it's, it's done. <coughs> we talked about the Word of God in Revelation 19, where it talks about the sword going out of His mouth that that sword is the word. It's a word. Okay, so as we go on here in Revelation 21, uh, he said in verse six, and he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that it is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. Look up. If you're uh, chapter 22, in verse 1, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Do you see that water, that river that flows, is the water of life. Mm -hmm. And so when um, Jesus, and this is Jesus, he's saying, I am Alpha and Omega, you can go back to the first chapter in Revelation 
and um, we'll see it there. One at eight, it says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. And then in verse 11 of Revelation 1, it says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Over and over again, we see uh, the He is. He is the first and the last, because that's what Alpha and Omega is, is the beginning and the ending. Uh, and he wants, if you're thirsty, let me tell you, you may thirst, a natural thirst, but if you are have a, a strong desire, a desire for more of him, you are thirsty. You, you know, sometimes we think, well, I'll just go get a drink. Of, uh, there's water in the refrigerator back there. I'll just get a bottle of water. It'll quench. But that's only temporary. Mm -hmm. Jesus gives you this water. Uh, he said in John 4, where you never thirst again. Mm -hmm. Never thirst again. He satisfies a longing within oh, you yeah. that only he can. Mm -hmm. And verse 7 here of Revelation 21, he says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. You know, um, when I see the overcomers, I think of you. Yeah. <laughs> but I really, I think about the messages in Revelation 2 and 3, where there is a message to each one of the individual churches there in Asia, and there is a, a promise to the overcomers. And we have got to be overcomers. We cannot let things in this life, it's just not worth it. There's just nothing in this world that should entice us or trap us or beset us, like fall back, backslide. Mm -hmm. We have to be overcomers. He that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. I was thinking of Romans chapter 8. Romans is uh, a wonderful passage, but chapter 8 especially. Um, uh, Romans 8 and 16, it says, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. As we get a little bit farther in Revelation 21, you're going to see that this city, the bride, this new Jerusalem, she has the <coughs> glory of God. She has it. And, and that is going to be revealed in us. Verse 19 of Romans 8 says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. And I, I just, I could read on, but I just want you to realize that that's the whole point of this, is that we're redeemed now, but it does not really show what we are going to be. It's like in Galatians 4, it says, right now we're like servants. It doesn't really appear that we're the sons of God that he has intended for us to be, but we are in bondage to this earth and this body right now. But that's not, that's not the end of the, the story. That's right. Okay, so here... Um, uh, you know, for some reason, when I was talking about the the uh, new heaven and the earth, I, I had meant to bring out Second Peter. Can I bring this out here too? Mm -hmm. uh, Second Peter chapter three. Uh, it talks in there uh, that in verse four that people say, uh, "Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue." 
you know, the verse before says, in the last days, there's going to be scoffers. Say, you keep saying that the hippie's coming, that you keep saying that this is going to happen, but, you know, things are just going on. It, but it says here, uh, in verse 7, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And then it goes on. I, I love verse 9 because people say, why hasn't Jesus come? Why, why has he delayed his coming? Verse 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some man for men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There is a perfect timing, but in some, he's waiting for hearts to turn. Yes. He's not willing. It's, it's not God's will. He doesn't will. want to give up anybody. No, he is looking. The next verse says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the melt elements shall melt with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness uh, there's another promise there you see that we have rainbows to remind us that god will never again flood the earth right that's not going to happen but it will burn up it will burn up it's here. It's just right here. Okay. I, I didn't mean to leave that out. I wanted to bring it out. I'm going back into Revelation 21 and verse 8. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This passage, that verse right there, goes with chapter 20 there at the great white throne because it talks about death and hell going into the lake of fire and that this is the second death. You know, it's forever. It, verse 10 it talks about the devil going into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's so one thing that we brought out is that nobody comes out of that lake of fire. It's there and it's eternal. Mm -hmm. it's, it's forever and ever. I want to encourage you to pray for your family members. I, I just like for your children and your loved ones, brothers and sisters, moms and dads, whatever your extended family is, pray for your loved ones because you do not want them to go there. I don't want to go there. And I want to do everything I can to reach out to family. Uh, that verse 8, that is a replay of what we saw in chapter 20. And then in verse 9 here in Revelation 21, it says, There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the last uh, seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. You know, when we just covered 19, it just says that it was granted to her that she would be arrayed in fine linen, pure and white. But that's the only description that gives us. But this one, you look at verse 10, it says, He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven 
from God. Do you see that there's the Lamb's wife? You, she's called that great city, holy Jerusalem. She's the bride. Um, and verse 11 says, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Crystal. I, this I, this great city, it, it's amazing to me how, how large it really is. Um, I know that in Brother Reeves, uh, Kenneth Reeves, when he was preaching, he told of a vision that he had and said that he was carried away in the spirit and saw this, this city and that it was just like clear as crystal in, in appearance. Um, but as we go on and we see here, it says, and had a great, a wall great and high and had 12 gates. Now it's got a, a great wall, it says, and 12 gates. If you look on down here uh, in verse 21, it says the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. 12 gates, there's 12 pearls. Each individual gate is of one pearl never seen anything like that never yes it is and um, at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel so in my mind I envision these gates as having the names like Reuben Yes, Gad, Dan, they're all there. Uh, it tells us here um, in verse 13, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. Uh, there it, this city is four square. We're going to read that here in just a minute. Four squares in verse 16. Go ahead. I heard a preacher today, and I was trying to listen to it. I was in the car, but I got interrupted. He was on the radio. I can't name his name. I remember who he was. But he said he was talking about Revelation and the four beasts. And, you know, he said those four beasts. This is the part I just caught. I don't know where he got his message from. But those four beasts represented the four the foundations. The foundations and represented the church. Now, I don't know how he came up with that. And that's just all the part I caught. And I didn't get to hear his lesson on it. Have you thought of anything like that? No, because the four beasts are mentioned numerous times. He was talking about him having these, these like Sardis and all of this stuff. I don't know how he connects that in there. So maybe I shouldn't have brought it up. Anyway. Okay. Well, hold that thought because obviously um, there's a, an angel there at each of these gates. There's three gates on each side, three times four, because yeah. it's a four square church or building. I'm, I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> the bride is the church, right. the body of Christ, <laughs> New okay. Jerusalem, all different words for same the same thing, right? That there are angels uh, there. It, it says, uh, Verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundation and in their names of the, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. It, to me, a foundation is uh, like uh, stories. You know, I, I see it going up in height mm -hmm. because uh, as we get in here, uh, it's the base of everything to build on. Right. Yes, you have the 12 tribes representing Old Testament. You have 12 apostles representing the New Testament. I, I see this uh, in Ephesians chapter 2 where um, I just want to go over there. Right now, you and I are citizens of this heavenly place. We're not there yet, but we are spiritually. I, I don't know whether... I'm making that clear, but I see this in Ephesians 2 because um, it tells us that we once walked according to this course of this 
world and we're under the influence of the enemy, the children of disobedient. But that's a former conversation. That's verse 3. But um, it tells us that we are fellow citizens now and um, that he's raised us up. This is verse 6. Has raised us up and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And the ages to come is what we're seeing in Revelation 21. We're looking for that to be fulfilled. Uh, it tells us that in that passage there in Ephesians 2 that there was a division between the Jew and the Gentile. In Ephesians 2 it calls them the circumcision and the uncircumcision. But we know that he abolished the enmity that was between us when he made peace uh, through the cross. It says uh, in verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Then it, it goes on in here and says in verse 19 to 22, this is Ephesians 2. It says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of God and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles. You see foundation there? How the apostles' names are on the 12 foundations of the city. Mm -hmm. And it tells us here, and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together and habitation of God through the Spirit. God sees those things right now. He sees you and me that we're a part of this heavenly city called New Jerusalem. One day that that city is going to come down from the heavenlies as a bride, adorned, ready for the marriage. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing in Revelation 21. And these 12 foundations here um, it have the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. That's in verse 14. Then he says in verse 15, he says, And the city lies four square. And the length is as large as the breadth, and the measure, the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length, the breadth, and the height of it are equal, equal. Okay, this is a huge, huge city. Because it tells us that um, the dimensions are the same. If you go wide, or you go long, or you go high, it's it's like a cube, same dimension, same, and it's 12,000, it tells us, furlongs in verse 16. And so uh, that is like 1,500 miles. Mm -hmm. it, 1,500 miles. Do you know that that's like, our country is like 3,000 miles across from coast to coast. That's roughly, because it depends on where you're at when you're measuring, right? I'm just giving you an estimate. I, I think of Oklahoma, where we're at, is about halfway, but really it's not. I think we're about 1,300 miles to the west coast. But can you imagine a city that is that big, that goes that distance this way and that distance that way? But not only that, but goes that distance upward. Now, the highest point on this earth right now is Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. And it measures about five and a half miles. I just told you that this, the dimensions of this city is like 1,500. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? Now, you know what? In my mind, I'm thinking, some people that are going to be on the upper foundation might not be able to breathe. But when God makes a new heaven and a new earth, you're not going to have any trouble breathing. You know, there are a lot of people that can't go to Colorado 
because the elevation is too much and their heart or their breathing can't. That's right, it, it messes with your body. But you know what? You're not gonna have to worry about that. Isn't that a wonderful the air we thing? Breathe and he is there. That's right. You don't have to worry about air. New heaven and new earth, you won't have to worry about these things. I think our time is about out. Do you um, any questions? Anything that's come to your mind? Oh, we will recap and we will go on. So if you have thoughts, keep it in mind and we will pick up and go on. Ada, why don't you close us out tonight? Thank you, Lord Jesus, again, Lord, for the word we partook of and shared and the many oh, thoughts that's gone into our minds, God. We just yeah, ask Lord, you, Lord, to be with us, God, and help us to be spiritually led and to spiritually discern your word, God, and to be ready for your coming, for that's our blessed hope, God, that we might see our Lord and Savior face to face and be with you and be part of that new Jerusalem, God, that we just could never deserve it for what you've done on that cross and what you've laid down and done for us and prepared for us. Help us, God, to go on and carry through all the troubles and the tribulations, God, looking to that great city and that time to be with you, Lord. And we just praise you and thank you for what you've done, what you're going to do. Keep us all safe, Lord, and bring us back to study again. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.